Telegraph Hill. We're standing in front of Coit Tower, looking north across the bay. Uh, to our west, we'll see the Golden Gate Bridge and most of the city laid out. To our north, of course, we see Alcatraz Island, with Angel Island, the point of Sausalito and Tiburon and Belvedere, and everything else is lost in the fog, unfortunately, today. To our east, if you were, could see around this wall, you would see the Bay Bridge also. San Francisco looked very, very different years ago than it does today. If we were to look at the waterfront where the trees are off to the west, which is called Black Point and is now part of Fort Mason, from there to here what we, what we see is actually flatland, which we call our marina district. A hundred years ago that was water. What we call North Beach was in fact a beach. The water and the water uh, line came all the way up past where, where we now have Bay Street. So that part of the land is, is landfill. Uh, it, were we to go around this point and come back around to the east and southeast, we would also find water. When Captain Montgomery sailed his ship, the Portsmouth, in here and claimed San Francisco as a territory of the United States, he beached his small craft on the corner of what we now know as Clay and Montgomery. That's where the Transamerica Pyramid Building stands. It was water and it was beachfront. Portsmouth Square was on the beach. Um, so as you see, most of our waterfront, our present day waterfront was, is indeed landfill and the, the buildings that are on it now are built on very shaky ground. Telegraph Hill's importance in the city was this, that ver for that very reason, that this was the first place that people were able to land and of course the first place that they lived until they could land a job and get settled and then move out a little bit. As a result, the first slums were on the slopes of Telegraph Hill. The first houses of prostitution were on the slopes of Telegraph Hill. The name of Telegraph Hill comes from a semaphore system that was set up here in the 1850s. It was a wooden platform with wooden semaphores, wooden boards really, attached to it that were pivoted. They could move. The townspeople had a whole system of signals, which everyone was familiar with, to determine what sort of ship was coming into port. Now again, people of San Francisco had only one way of making contact with the rest of the world. That was by water. When ships would come in, they wanted to know what kind of ship. Was it bringing their loved ones? Was it bringing letters from home? Was it bringing supplies? So the, the, ver the position of the wooden semaphores at the top of the hill would signify to the people below what sort of ship was coming in, and then everyone would rush to the waterfront. There's a funny story that I, that I learned when I was researching this, that in a place called the American Theater downtown, they were doing a production of The Hunchback. And the lead character in the play came running out on stage and he said, what meaneth this, my lord? And a little kid way up in the gal gallery, up, way up in top of the theater, shouted out, side wheel steamer. Well, it brought the house down. Everybody in the audience knew what he was talking about. However, the cast was from New York City. They had no idea why everyone was laughing in the middle of this serious play and, and it tore them apart. They could no longer perform. They ended it and the theater emptied out. That was the end of that. There was a group of pioneers, however, who felt that the city was about, the, the, the Telegraph Hill was about to be overdeveloped. And in order to preserve it, purchased the top of this hill, which we now call Pioneer Park in their honor, in 1876 and donated it to the city. Now, for years and years it lay idle. There, was, there were several people, several entrepreneurs tried to do a lot of things up here. They built, one gentleman built a castle with an observatory and a huge restaurant. His business was a failure because he was unable to get people to come up here to spend their money. There was no access to the hill except by foot. So he decided, well, maybe he would establish the first cable car in San Francisco. He hooked a rope onto a team of horses put it up to the top of a hill around a wooden pulley, around back down the hill and hitched it to a cable car, filled the cable car with people and proceeded to drive the horses down the hill, which would in turn bring the cable car up the hill. Well, rope being what it, does, what it is and friction being what it is, ro many, many ropes broke, lots of people were lost, lots of horses were lost, and the, that idea was abandoned. In 
50s, there was a young girl named Lily Hitchcock who came here with her family. She arrived in 1851. She was eight years old. There are lots of stories about what made Lily Hitchcock be such a fire buff. My, my favorite version, and I think the one that is probably the closest to being the truth, is that when Lily left, her father had been a surgeon at West Point. Uh, he decided he was going to come out here not to be a military doctor, but to be a doctor to the people who were going to the gold mines. When they, before they left in preparation, they went to visit her grandmother's plantation. The day that they left, the, the, the night before they left, her grandmother's plantation burned to the ground. Now, this was the only home she really knew. That was her roots. When she, got, when she arrived in San Francisco, she came in May of 1851, when she arrived here, San Francisco, four days earlier, had burned to the ground. And I think if you realize an eight-year-old girl having left her, her only home, burned to the ground, arrived in her new home, burned to the ground, I think it would have a really startling effect on her, and indeed it did. She became the darling of the, of the fire department. She chased fire trucks constantly, would jump out the second, the, the, like, it's like a story and a half, window of her house onto the roof of this little shed, run out in the middle of the night to chase the fire trucks and, she, and the, the uh, horse carts. And she would encourage them up the hill. Now, horses had to draw all the hose carts up the hill before they had trucks. And she would stand there and shout to them, come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it. The closest fire station to her house, of course, was the Knickerbocker 5 Hose Company, and that was the station that she followed the most. They adopted her as their mascot, and, and at, at some point in her adult life, Lily Hitchcock was so devoted to the fire department, she had her table linens and her underwear monogrammed LHC, Lily Hitchcock Coit, and the number 5 underneath that for Knickerbocker 5 Hose Company. Uh, when L Lily lived, she, she actually left her, her father's home. Her father was, as I understand, quite a tyrant. She left her father's home, married a man named Howard Coit, who turned out to be, I guess, as bad as her dad. Um, she, although they were married for a long, long time, they did not live together very long. Lily one day was entertaining a suitor in the Palace Hotel, and another uh, uh, suitor who she had sort of put aside, cast aside, came charging through the door and started firing at them. He killed the man that was with her and scared her so badly that she left this country and went to France. She spent the re most of the rest of her days traveling the royal circuit in Europe and was the darling of the, of the courts, mainly because of the kind of woman she was. She was not all that wealthy for the time, but she was an extremely vivacious kind of person. She, as an example, she was, she was discovered uh, missing from her summer home in Napa County. Um, when they finally found her, the headlines the next day blasted out, Lily Coit found camping with five men in the woods in Napa. She also was the first woman to ice skate in public, the first woman of society to ice skate in public. That was frowned upon because in order to ice skate, you have to shorten your skirts or you're going to get tangled up and fall. Well, she shortened her skirts quite a bit so that she could ice skate and was found ice skating at Woodward's Gardens on Valencia Street. She did a lot of things that were not normally done by women of society in San Francisco, and she created quite a name for herself and quite a scandal because of it. Um, one quote I read about Lily Coit says that she could ride, drink, and smoke cigars like a, and, oh, and play poker like a member of the cavalry. And she really did. There are lots of pictures of her in men's costumes. She would, she would don men's costumes to go to bars so that she could play poker and drink. And there are pictures of her like that in that kind of a disguise. Well, when Lily died, which was in 1929, she did die in this country. She came back here the year before that. She left one-third of her, her estate, in her words, to beautify the city that I love so much. She did not know they were going to build a tower. As a matter of fact, she had an aversion to heights, so I don't think she would have built a tower. But she did leave the money. That money turned out to be about $118,000. So you can see, for being a third of her estate, she was not really that wealthy. The um, city fathers, being what they were at the time, decided that the money that they were going to, they were that they got from her estate, they were going to use to build part of a macadam roadway that was going to surround Lake Merced until a few people in the city jumped up and said, wait a minute, that's much too mundane. You can't do that to Lily Coit. She would, she would 
die one more time if you did something like that. So they decided instead they would put a memorial to Lily uh, right here in Pioneer Park. They had no plan in mind, so they held a contest, a design contest. Architects from all over the country submitted ideas. The winning design is what you see in front of you. It was designed by the firm of Arthur Brown Jr., although the, the actual designer of the tower was a man named Henry Howard. There was a family of Howards in Berkeley. The father has had done many of the buildings on the Berkeley campus and a lot of the city buildings in the East Bay. The whole family was very talented architecturally. Henry Howard designed the building. Um, the, the reason that the design won was quite interesting. The biggest reason was because of the inexpense of building it. It was the cheapest thing that they could do according to the city fathers. Um, the entire building, including landscaping of the top of the hill, was put up at a cost of $124,000, and this was in 1933. That's really not very much money. The reason that it's so inexpensive is because the building is made of reinforced concrete. And when you think about reinforced concrete the way we do it today, we do what we call continuous pouring of, of concrete. In those days, they didn't do that. And the sketch, the specs for the building called for the top of the building to be 18 inches less in diameter than the bottom, and they didn't know how to do that. But someone figured it out. Each day they poured a certain amount, they poured a four foot segment each day. Someone calculated that if you were to take the wooden forms down at the end of the day and shave them by a certain amount and put them back up the next day, that they would indeed make a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. Well, it worked and it, and it did come out right. An interesting fact about the building of, this, of the tower is that the wood scaffolding that was used when they built it was sold at a profit to the city. Wood was, was in such demand at the time. So the building was built in 1933. Um, it sat idle for a while. Now the only artwork that was actually conceived before the building was built and was planned into the building was the, the phoenix and the bundled fascia that you see on the front of the building. That was designed by a gentleman named Robert Howard who was Henry Howard's brother. The phoenix of course is the symbol of the city of San Francisco. The phoenix bird in mythology is, is a bird that dies in flame and then is reborn from its own ashes. And because San Francisco burned seven times in the 1850s and 60s, completely to the ground and was rebuilt so quickly, we have adopted the phoenix as our seal. Um, as our city symbol. The bundled fascia, this again was 1933, this was pre-Mussolini, so the bundled fascia meant the same thing that it meant to him at the beginning of his reign, and that is that in unity there is strength, and that's all that it meant. But that was the only art that was designed into the building. What is now inside is a series of frescoes that were done later on. Uh, in the early, late 20s and early 30s, there was a Mexican artist named Diego Rivera who was a mural painter, a fresco painter, who had done a lot of the city buildings and government buildings in Mexico. He made a swing through the United States and left his mark on a lot of spots. He did come through San Francisco and a lot of the artists that eventually worked on this building worked with him when he was here. Now we're in the middle of a depression having followed the stock market crash. The government was looking for alternative forms of, of employment for almost anyone in the country. A group of artists met at the uh, Old Whitcomb Hotel, which is now the San Franciscan on Market at 8th Street. They got together, this is what they had decided to do. They wanted to paint a wall, they wanted to do fresco painting, and they knew that they could convince the government, they were sure that they could convince the government to pay for it. They sent a night letter off to a man named Edward Bruce, who was really a friend, it turned out. He was not only a San Franciscan, he worked in the Department of Treasury, he was also an artist, and he was a really good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. She, he, he persuaded the Roosevelts to fund this. This was prior to the WPA projects. This was called a PWAP project, Public Works of Art project. They said, sure, and in, a, in record time for a bureaucracy, within two weeks, they had an okay to go ahead and start painting. Twenty-five artists were selected to work on the murals in Coit Tower. The theme is life in California in 1934. Four of the murals in Coit Tower that were considered by the 
Art Commission and by the press and by members of the public that saw them at least to be controversial to the point that they were not allowed to open Coit Tower when the artworks were done. Uh, this particular one, which is called City Life and was done by Victor Arnatoff, is the first of these four. The, um, he has depicted what the downtown of San Francisco was actually like in 1934. Now you'll notice on his newspaper kiosk he has the San Francisco Examiner, the Call Bulletin, the San Francisco News, the Chicago Daily. On the other side, he also has included the New Masses and the Daily Worker, both socialist papers of the day. The, um, the thing that was, so, uh, was, was fired upon so greatly by the press is that they left out, when he painted, he left out the Chronicle. The other thing that they pointed out, specifically in this particular mural, is this very dapper gentleman standing right here. Oh, looking at the New York Stock Exchange, obviously very much interested in it. Well, we're in 1934, the stock market crash was in 1929. People were indeed interested in what was going on with their stocks. But what they said was he is, he's absorbed in his newspaper about the stock exchange at the same time standing on another newspaper that depicts uh, talks about someone being gunned down in the street and they said how very callous and crude. If we, if we travel down here now, we'll look at another, the second of the four controversial murals in the, in the tower. This is the library scene, which is done by Bernard Baruch Zakheim. This particular mural is controversial for a, a number of reasons also. I, in doing research, saw a paste up in a newspaper of this gentleman right here with a headline blasted across the front saying, Taxpayers revolt, look what your money is being spent for, propaganda. And he's reaching for an what they called an alternative form of government. He's reaching for a book by Karl Marx. If we turn in this direction, we see the surveyor and the steel worker done by Clifford White. As innocuous as they may appear, if you look at the background, the color of the background paint from the portrait to the area above the window, you'll see that it's a different color. The reason for this is that this is the only mural of the four controversial ones that was in, in fact uh, changed by the Art Commission. They, re they refused to open Coit Tower to the public un when the paintings were done until that portion was painted out. In researching this I particular item, I found an article in the San Francisco News that talks about what was there. On the right-hand side, over the window, they had placed a piece of woven cable with the, uh, the American dollar sign and uh, In God We Trust. And on this side, they had put on the left a hammer and sickle and the words, workers of the world unite. The press and the art commission were upset at the depiction of the communist slogan, workers of the world unite, and refused to allow the building to be open for the public until that was taken out. Down here on the end wall, we see the fourth of the controversial murals. This one done by John Langley Howard, another brother of the illustrious Berkeley Howard family. This mural came under the direct fire of the Art Commission and the, and the press and the general public for a couple of reasons. The first of the reasons is this demonstration that we see right here in the corner. And if you notice, one of the gentlemen in back of these leaders here has a newspaper in his hand. And the newspaper talks about demonstrating on May 1st, speak out against fascism. Well, May 1st demonstrations are normally social, socialistic demonstrations. The press didn't seem to be very concerned about that fact as much as they were that this particular demonstration was headed by or, or co-sponsored or whatever. The leader was fine. He's a blue-eyed, blonde American. However, the two co-leaders, one is black and one is Latin. The press was outraged that, that the artist would depict people of that ethnic, those ethnic backgrounds who would be speaking out against anything. They thought that that should not happen in this country. On the other side, the other part of the mural that was so controversial that Howard did, he's depicted two 
families in juxtaposition, one very, very poor and one quite obviously very wealthy. In the, in the face of a magnificent brand new hydroelectric source, we have a very poor itinerant family panning gold, washing their clothes by hand in the stream, and a very, obviously very elderly woman cutting wood by hand, sawing wood by hand. Watching them, Howard has put in, in a, in a real strong fashion, has put in a, the very wealthy family that has come to watch these poor folks out in the country. And he's, he's made the contrast so vivid. He's put in an old broken down Model T car, and on the other side, of course, the brand new bright gold Chrysler Airflow engine car. He has the little, the, the poor folks dog with, with skin and bones showing, and then the uh, chubby little Pekingese dog that came with the chauffeur. So what he has done here is he has shown the two, uh, the wide ends of society today, in the, in the time, in 1934. He has shown the very rich and the very poor. The press and the art commission thought this was a very subtle but very damning statement on the Times. It was, in fact, true. There was a stock market crash in 1929, and the resultant depression, what, what that did is wipe out literally the middle class of this country, the rising middle class of this country. And what it left were the very poor and the very, very wealthy. The very, very wealthy had, they did not hold stocks and bonds, they held real estate. They maintained their real estate. The middle class who held stocks and bonds and who speculated lost everything they had, resulting in a very small upper class and or rich class of people and everybody else. And this is what Howard was trying to depict in his painting, although it was put down. When you visit Coit Tower, remember the significance of Telegraph Hill in the early life and growth of San Francisco. Remember the artists and political times that blended to form the beautiful murals. And remember the extraordinary woman whose love of San Francisco made Coit Tower possible. Coit Tower, landmark of the city.